the uh, case against Thomas Caldwell, who has been indicted, alleged to be a member of a group called the Oath Keepers. And in the indictment of Caldwell, there is uh, a person, two, that is named, who, quote, also stormed the barricades at the Capitol. The government indictment uh, of Caldwell further indicates that um, there was a, a person, three, uh, organizers of the uh, quick reaction force that Caldwell believed would be there. Um, he had a hotel, th this person three had a ho hotel room. So the question is, um, who are these unindicted co-conspirators, unindicted and unnamed co-conspirators that were essentially organizers of this illegal activity? And Tucker Carlson asks, the government knows who they are, but they're government has not charged them. Why is that? He suggests they were, they were almost certainly working for the FBI. So FBI operatives were organizing the attack on the Capitol on January 6th, according to government documents. And those two are not alone, said Carlson. Um, yeah, I mean, infiltrating organizations that uh, are planning illegal activities is certainly the job of the FBI. But uh, is there any indication that they went beyond that scope, that law enforcement uh, uh, power that they have, and um, fomented something that otherwise would not have happened? Because that's sort of the implication. You know, this, this January 6th was organized by the FBI. I think that's a little ham-handed in terms of the characterization of the position that Tucker Carlson is taking, but he is certainly suggesting that the FBI has some culpability here or is being less than forthright mm -hmm. about uh, this this matter of unindicted co-conspirators, for yeah. example. He said it would be not be out of character. For um, some reaction to that and perspective, pleased to be joined again by Kevin Brock, former Assistant Director of Intelligence for the FBI and former Principal Deputy Director of the National Counterterrorism Center. Kevin, thanks for being with us again. Appreciate it. Hey, good morning, Dan and Amy. How are you doing? Good morning. So good. Um, what, what about this? Uh, so this is be, what, what Carlson said and what others have suggested is being dismissed as, you know, Trumpian conspiracy theories and so forth. But how do you respond to the case that Tucker Carlson made? Well, if, if Tucker's right, it would be obviously – quite disturbing and uh, I have a lot of respect for Tucker I've been on his his show he's he asked some of the most important questions that are being asked uh, these days and um, but I can bring a little bit of perspective on this that that might uh, you know help help ease people's concern in this regard I'm not saying that it's out of the realm of possibility that all of these unindicted co-conspirators might have had a hand in cooperating with the government uh, but generally, when you see that term used, it's because somebody has started to cooperate post-event. Uh, if there's an informant involved, a cooperating witness, as we used to call them in the FBI, uh, or an undercover, generally they're not brought into the judicial process and named anything. They're just left. They're just ignored and and uh, and left off charging documents completely. Uh, not implying that there are people out there who uh, who are cooperating ahead of the event and uh, are not being charged. That said, it is pretty well known, and and I was involved in this in my career, early in my career, when uh, during the late 80s and early 90s, we had a spike in uh, right-wing extremist anti-government violence uh, uh, groups in this country, skinheads, Aryan nations, a group called the Order that were involved in direct violent activities uh, that we were pretty successful in squelching. And the way that the FBI did that was infiltrating those groups. Aryan nations would have a Congress every year up in Ohio, uh, Idaho. Uh, there'd be 150 to 200 people show up and half of them were FBI informants, frankly. Uh, it's, it's, it's a group of individuals that is not hard to penetrate uh, they are known to be of inadequate personalities. They're not. They're not any. 
they're not a group of people that generally are successful in life. And so they're attracted to extremist ideologies to make them feel good about themselves. And uh, when the FBI comes in and substitutes themselves as a as an ideology worth fighting for, they quickly switch sides. But was the FBI so, encouraging the informants to commit violent acts? Well, and then this is the next point. So the FBI is well aware of the boundaries uh, of entrapment. And that would certainly be an entrapping activity if if the FBI was leading individuals to a violent outcome or or uh, you know putting ideas in their head. Generally, when you infiltrate, you're there to gather information. You react to uh, the desires of the violent group. Uh, we had an undercover uh, agent in a Esther group up in Seattle when I was up there. That had expressed a desire to blow up a Burlington Northern uh, train, and it was they who had the idea. They that wanted to implement the plan. We put in an undercover agent to monitor that and um, and feed information. They were all indicted, and put in jail before they they could do any damage. So those those boundaries are well established. If if there's if it comes out that the FBI had informants or undercover agents in these groups cajoling moving them in a certain direction, organizing, that would be out of bounds. And, 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 and these cases will be quickly dismissed if that becomes, if that becomes the uh, true. Yeah, so, it, it, I mean, I read the, when I, I, I watched Carlson's commentary and, and read the indictment he was referencing and the person two, person three, I mean, to make an analogy that uh, all of us in Illinois are familiar with because of so many politicians that have been indicted, we go through these indictments and, you know, the, the, the person A or the politician B, I mean, those are not um, government assets. Those are targets often. So you indict a lower level mm-hmm. person while you're still building the case as you're trying to work your way up the food chain. We've seen that play out right. in the, right. the indictment of, of George Ryan and other governors and so on. So so that's how I sort of interpret that initially. But that's not to say that, as you were suggesting, that you don't have that that because we know the FBI had some intel about uh, nefarious activities planned for January 6th that somehow didn't make its way to the Capitol Police. And that's a whole nother mm-hmm. kettle of fish. But it, so it's possible that if they had uh, knowledge that uh, some bad actions was possible, that they, you know, Donnie Brasco to uh, these groups and, and got some people in mm-hmm. there to, to, as you say, to do information gathering and to try and stave off any any sort of serious violence. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing, Dan, is uh, what a point that Tucker makes in his presentation, I think is vitally important, is that, is that now we have this um, policy that's been articulated by the Biden administration to attack uh, violent extremists, specifically yeah. racially motivated violent extremists, and you have the attorney general coming out and making statements uh, about uh, playing off of that, saying we must adopt a broader societal response to tackle this problem. You have academics who uh, were quoted in The Washington Post saying that, uh, you know, th- this is this is an effort to prevent radicalization by addressing broader societal problems. This is where my antenna goes up, because the FBI took a lot of pains uh, back when they were started battling domestic uh, terrorism to make sure that the ideology behind it, the driving it, doesn't come into play in prosecutor decision. It's the violence. You focus on the violence. Anybody who's violent and, and is being motivated by uh, ideology, religion, uh, ethnicity, any of those things, it's the violence that you focus on that we have to stop. And you don't get caught up in making decisions about what group needs to be prosecuted more aggressively than another group. It's not a definition by group. It's a definition by violence. Here you have a policy being set that seems to be trying to define a group and then talking about broader societal issues and then and white supremacy. And to Tucker's point, it's a term that's not defined. And suddenly you get people being, being swept up and, and suspicions. Uh, because they oppose critical race theory, for example, and we got a bunch of parents yeah. here in Virginia that have been doing that. Yeah. So. Well, and, and this is exactly right. So th- this is the national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. This document, and uh, included there, uh, just to provide some specifics to what you're describing. Uh, this is from that document. 
We are therefore prioritizing efforts to ensure that every component of the government has a role to play in rooting out racism and advancing equity for underserved communities that have far too often been targets of discrimination and violence. This approach must apply to our efforts to counter domestic terrorism by addressing underlying racism and bigotry. And, um, you know, I mean, it doesn't take much reading between the lines to uh, to, to, to go exactly where you went, which is this is a, about purging political opponents. Or certainly it could be used to purge political opponents under that mission statement. That's right. And, and I, I think if there had been an even handed treatment uh, with a, a of violence stemming from any group, and we saw a whole summer of violence from people who don't vote Republican. Uh, frankly, that you know they they could be uh, they could be uh, painted as Biden supporters, just like the uh, January sixth insurrectionists were pay- are characterized as Trump supporters. Uh, that violence that occurred over the summer can be defined as domestic terrorism, uh, and if 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 all violence is called out no matter what the source ideological source or motivator is then okay we have an even-handed approach the, i think the concern of the american people right now is that they're seeing a justice system that is being skewed in one direction and and ignoring the violence coming out of another direction and and that's that's not good for any of us yeah because you don't see you know I, I feel like they're not going after the looters that destroyed chicago not once but twice but yet anytime somebody that was at the capitol january 6th you know that's a headline here in Chicago. Yeah, and and in Minneapolis and Seattle, where there were charges uh, issued and, and people arrested, they were quickly either released or their charges dismissed. Um, and and we don't see that same treatment on the uh, on the January sixth insurrection. I'm not suggesting they should. Uh, those people were uh, many of them were violent. Many of them were uh, took actions that we all find distasteful and should be charged. But there's got to be Lady Justice has to have a blindfold, and, and that's and it has to be an even-handed approach to violence wherever we find it. And right now, there's a concern that even-handedness is, well, is missing. A lot of them are being held without bond, and they didn't attack a police officer. There was just trespassing charges and going into, you know, the the Senate chambers. Mm-hmm. I think of that guy Jake from bit... Air, you know, that was dressed up like a, a wolf. He's being held without bond, and that just doesn't right, seem well, fair. Well, and a lot of that is the difference between being charged federally and being charged with state and local charges. Uh, the riots in these cities, or a lot of them charges are, are uh, state and local charges. The, the January 6th event dismissed. was, was yeah. federal. Yeah, it's more easily dismissed. And, and federal, in federal, you charge federally, you don't, you don't, you don't get a shot at bond. So, you know. Uh, let, I, I just want to re- rewind a bit. So, you know, you mentioned Merrick Garland, and we could throw in the entire Biden administration with this. And, and frankly, Christopher Ray too, this idea that um, white supremacists present the greatest uh, domestic threat to America. And mm-hmm. since you were talking mm-hmm. about your involvement in, um, in bringing uh, neo-Nazis to justice, you know, you know, through, as you said, the focus on the violence or the, the threat of violence, can you, mm-hmm. can you give us any sense, uh, like rank order priority, you know, what groups, organizations present the greatest threat? How, how do you receive... Nobody's here defending neo-Nazis, but how do you receive this obsession with saying white supremacy, white supremacy, white supremacy? This is what is tearing our country apart. And so we're going to tear our country apart in order to prevent white supremacists from tearing our country apart. Exactly. So historically, uh, we saw violence uh, in the 60s from the left. The radical left was putting bombs down everywhere, uh, whether weather. underground and yeah. the, the all that stuff. So, and then it kind of shifted to the extreme uh, right, uh, anti-government, white supremacists, you know, uh, in the 80s and, and during that time. Mo- a lot, most of the violence that's been committed since uh, certainly the late 80s through Oklahoma City and everything that has come from the, the radical anti-government uh, element. And by the way, not all of those uh, radical anti-governments on the right were white supremacists. They were just angry at the government. So um, the, but it, the, in fairness, that, that's where the violence has come in, in recent times. Now with the rise of Antifa, uh, violent elements of BLM and that type of thing, you see violence on the left as well to, to my earlier point. So uh, it's not, it's not, 
incorrect for the Justice Department or the FBI to react to where violence is coming from. And they've, they've articulated their concerns about the, the, uh, the white supremacist motivator. Uh, just my point, it has to be – you have to recognize it all. And um, you know, being a white supremacist is not against the law. Uh, they're distasteful. Uh, yeah. You know, everybody usually reacts poorly to that. But 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 if you're going to then commit violence because of those beliefs, that's that's where you trigger law enforcement. Well, law. right. And you know what other what else being a white supremacist is being a leftist a neo-Nazis. Those are leftist groups. Right. Uh, National socialism. Uh, being a white supremacist is, is being an identitarian. That's that's left. That's not right, and uh, I wish more, well, I wish more Republicans would uh, push back against this characterization that that's a, that's a, those that you know conservative or right wing violence. It's not that they, those are men and women of the left. No, that's that's a great point, and and, and frankly, uh, the white supremacists align with the views of the Jim Crow South, and and all of those were were Democrat policies. So there you go. Kevin Brock, former assistant uh, director of intelligence for the FBI, former principal deputy director of the National Counterterrorism Center as well. Kevin, thanks as always for joining us. Enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's like a hot, steaming cup of information to start your day. It's Chicago's morning answer on AM 560, the answer. The Lou Dobbs Financial Report is brought to you by Signature Bank helping local businesses succeed. Visit SignatureBank.Bank for your commercial banking needs. I'm Bill Alexander in for Lou Dobbs. President Biden signs Juneteenth legislation. TikTok owner profits skyrocket. And a software bug found on airline websites. Those stories next. Let's see, something costs less, but people are happier with it? That sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month. And that's huge, but it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 877-64-BIBLE. That's 877-64-BIBLE. 877 877- 